let's have a conversation about Marc de True. I'm sure some Belgian lads on here will have a lot to say. Pedophile who abducted and raped several girls. Built a dungeon in one of his several homes. Ties to politicians, policemen and Belgian elites. Evidence of a trafficking ring around Europe. Trial was dragged out for years and stonewalled numerous times. Lead investigator failed to investigate the screams of children in his home and failed to watch videotapes of children trapped in his home who later died of starvation. Ties to a cult known as Abrasax which was raided and found to possess child porn and a human skull. Ties to other cases involving assassination and bribery, implicating a NATO general. 26 witnesses killed during the trial. Some shot, some drugged, some in car crashes but most were aware their lives were in danger. Judge mentioned threats on his life by shadowy figures. DNA of others found in his home never followed up. It's one of the closest we've come to seeing the outing of an elite pedophile ring. There are still so many questions that remain unanswered from the case, hardly any follow-ups on a lot of the murders and Detroux is due for release in two years. Here is a short example of some of the witness deaths. 15th of November, 1998. After calling the police to tell them that she has been threatened with death, by a car accident, in connection with her work. Car crash. 80 km per hour into bridge railing. His foot was found in a river one year later, the complete corpse was never found. Suicide, burned on bed, after bedroom was filled with methanol and lit on fire. On the way to the police after he called in to testify about the true via car crash, slammed with own car into building. There's 10 other witnesses who never got to officially state their experiences to the court because their testimony was deemed to not be credible. Either way there's a lot to discuss here. He was lower tier scum that runs somewhat amateur operation. The elite pedophiles learned to not rely on lower elements for their procuration of the innocent, and has since then reorganized completely. We're talking FBI slash CIA tier vans, with complete encrypted communication, overlook of every street, and a tap to the local 911 communication. According to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, roughly 800,000 children are reported missing each year in the United States, that's roughly 2,000 per day. Also keep in mind, most children aren't directly snatched and grabbed, instead broken household cannot defend themselves against the CP. S, but occasionally the elite want middle class white children, rather than black children from the ghetto, which nobody even asks where they went. There is many reasons why they push single motherhood, they are the weakest. Checked, and from our Pizzagate investigations and testimony of SRA survivors, there are kids that are bred in captivity, ones who don't exist on paper or birth records. They are kept hidden by the elite and no one knows of their existence they have the babies for sacrifice. There are also active breeders who volunteer because they are part of the coven. This is sick and frightening shit. Hard to deal with mentally when you look into that rabbit hole. To the vast majority of Americans, the name Marc de True doesn't mean much. Drop that name in Belgium though and you're likely to elicit some very visceral reactions. De True, convicted along with his wife in 1989 for the and violent abuse of five young girls, the youngest of whom was just 11, now stands accused of being a key player in an international child prostitution and pornography ring whose practices included kidnapping sadistic torture, and murder. Dutroux was sentenced in 1989 to 13 years for his crimes, but was freed after having served just three. This was in spite of the fact that, as prison governor Yvon Stewart would later tell a parliamentary commission, a medical report described him as a perverse psychopath, an explosive mix. He was an evident danger to society. The man who turned Dutroux loose on society, Justice Minister Malkyar Waitlet, soon after received a prestigious appointment to serve as a judge at the European Court of Justice at The Hague. Shortly after Dutroux's release, young girls began to disappear in the vicinity of some of his homes. Though technically unemployed and drawing welfare from the state, he nevertheless owned at least six houses and lived quite lavishly. His rather lucrative income appears to have been derived from trading in child slaves, child prostitution, and child pornography. Many of his houses appeared to stand vacant though at least some of them were in fact used as torture and imprisonment centers where kidnapped girls were taken and held in underground dungeons. Some of Dutroux's homes were used in this way for several years following his early release, with a growing body of evidence to indicate that fact to the police. True to form though, authorities failed to act on the information, or acted on it in a way that showed either complete incompetence, according to most press reports, or police complicity in the operation, according to any sort of logic. 
police seem to have routinely ignored tips that later proved to be accurate, including a report from Detroit's own mother that her son was holding girls prisoner in one of his houses. In addition, key facts were withheld from investigators working on the disappearances and lines of communication were unaccountably broken, inexcusably hindering the investigation. Police did search one of Detroit's homes on no less than three separate occasions over the course of the investigation. On at least two of those occasions, two of the missing girls were being held in heinous conditions imprisoned in a custom-built dungeon in the basement. Nevertheless, the police searches came up empty, despite the fact that the investigating officers reported hearing children's voices on one occasion, according to The Guardian. It was not until August 13, 1996, four years after the disappearances began, that authorities arrested Detroux, along with his wife, an elementary school teacher, a lodger, a policeman, and a man the Guardian described as an associate with political connections, elsewhere identified as Michelle Lilievra. Two days later, police again searched a true's home and discovered the soundproof dungeon-slash-torture center. As CNN reported, three years earlier police ignored tips from an informant who said Detroux was building secret cellars to hold girls before selling them abroad. And in 1995, the same informant had told police that Detroux had offered an unidentified third man the equivalent of $3,000 to $5,000 to kidnap girls. Incredibly, it was later reported by The Guardian that police actually had in their possession a videotape of the dungeon being constructed. Belgian police could have saved the lives of two children allegedly murdered by the pedophile Marc Detroux if they had watched a video seized from his home which showed him building their hidden cell. The tape had been seized in one of the earlier searches. At the time of the final search, two 14-year-old girls were found imprisoned in the dungeon, chained and starving. They described to police being used as child prostitutes and in the production of child pornography videos. More than 300 such videos were taken into custody by the police. On August 17, the story got grimmer as police dug up the bodies of two 8-year-old girls at another of Detroux's homes. It would later be learned that the girls had been kept in one of Detroux's dungeons for nine months after their abductions, during which time they were repeatedly tortured and sexually assaulted, all captured on videotape. The girls were then left to slowly starve to death. Alongside of their decimated corpses was the body of Bernard Weinstein, a former accomplice of Detroux who had occupied one of the houses for several years. Weinstein had been buried alive. A few weeks later, two more girls were found buried under concrete at yet another of the Detroux properties. By that time, ten people were reportedly in custody in connection to the case. Elsewhere in Belgium, the News Telegraph reported that, the corpses of two women and parts of a third body have been discovered in a freezer at a Lebanese restaurant in Brussels. As the body count mounted, the outrage of the Belgian people grew. They demanded to know why this man, dubbed the Belgian Beast, had been released after having served such an absurdly short sentence. And to know why, as evidence had continued to mount and girls had continued to disappear, the police had chosen to do nothing. How many girls, they demanded to know, had been killed as a result of this inaction? Adding further fuel to the fire, as a Los Angeles Times report revealed, was that, a highly regarded children's activist, Marie France Boat, claims that the Justice Ministry is sitting on a politically sensitive list of customers of pedophile videotapes. The same report noted that, the affair has become further clouded by the discovery of a motorcycle that reportedly matches the description of one used in the 1991 assassination of prominent Belgian businessman and politician André Coules. Michel Berlay, the head prosecutor on the pedophile case, meanwhile, has publicly declared that the investigation can be thoroughly pursued only without political interference. Several years ago, Berlay was removed from the highly charged Cools case, which remains unsolved. A report in Time magazine alluded to murky links between the Detroux operation and organized crime figures. Much later, Mark Verer will again. The chief investigating magistrate on the case, would bluntly state, for me. The Detroux affair is a question of organized crime. Also mentioned in the Time article was the use of secret underground tunnels, not unlike those described by children a decade earlier at the infamous McMartin Preschool. Outrage continued to grow as more arrests were made and evidence of high-level government and police complicity continued to emerge. One of Detroux's accomplices, businessman Jean-Michel Nyoul, confessed to organizing an orgy at a Belgian chateau that had been attended by government officials, a former European commissioner, and a number of law enforcement officers. A Belgian senator would note, quite accurately, that such parties were part of a system which operates to this day and is used to blackmail the highly placed people who take part. In September, 
23 suspects, at least 9 of whom were police officers, were detained and questioned about their possible complicity in the crimes and or their negligence in investigating the case. As the Los Angeles Times noted in a very brief, two-sentence report, the detainments were the latest indication that police in the southern city of Charleroi may have helped cover up the alleged crimes of Mark Dutroux. The arrests followed raids on the police officers' homes and on the headquarters of the Charleroi Police Force and were based on information supplied by police inspector George Azuko, who had already been charged as an accomplice. Three magistrates had also reportedly been interrogated by police investigators. Just days before the arrests, police had also arrested five suspects in the Cools assassination, including a former regional government minister named Alan van der Beest. Strangely enough, the News Telegraph reported that, police investigating the Cools murder in 1991, had been given helpful leads by some of those arrested in the Detroux case. The Telegraph also noted that Cools had promised shocking revelations before his death. On October 14 came the straw that broke the camel's back, Jean-Marc Connerat, who had been serving as the investigating judge on the case, was dismissed by the Belgian Supreme Court. Connerat was viewed by the people as something of a rarity, a public official slash law enforcement officer who actually appeared to be pursuing a prosecution, rather than a cover-up. The News Telegraph described him as, the only figure in the judiciary who enjoys the nation's confidence. As the New York Times reported, Connerat became a national hero in August after saving two children from a secret dungeon kept by a convicted child rapist and ordering the inquiry that led to the discovery of the bodies of four girls kidnapped by a child pornography network. He had also, in 1994, arrested three men as suspects in the Cools assassination, just before the case was transferred to the jurisdiction of another magistrate. His removal from the Detroux case fanned the smoldering flames of public outrage, the Times report noted that, hundreds of thousands of people had petitioned the High Court to retain the judge. Adding yet more fuel to the fire, prosecutor Michel Berlay was claiming that evidence suggested that a pedophile ring composed of the wealthy and powerful had been protected for 25 years. With the families of Detroux's victims calling for a general strike, men and women all across the country walked away from their jobs in protest as railway workers and bus drivers shut down public transportation, bringing some cities to a virtual standstill. The Telegraph reported that, in Liege, firemen turned their hoses on the city's court building to symbolize the massive cleanup that was in order. On October 20, 350,000 citizens of the tiny nation took to the streets of Brussels dressed all in white, demanding the reform of a system so corrupt that it would protect the abusers, rapists, torturers, and killers of children. The political fallout from the case would ultimately bring about the resignation of Belgium's state police chief, interior minister, and justice minister, likely sacrificial lambs tossed to the outraged masses to avoid what could easily have exploded into a full-scale insurrection by the people, particularly after police incompetence allowed Detroux to escape and remain at large for a brief time in April of 1998. There were in fact calls from the people for the entire coalition government to step down. Months later, an opinion survey by Brussels Le Soir newspaper found that only one in five Belgians still had confidence in the federal government and the nation's justice system. As the Los Angeles Times reported in January of 1998, the conviction remains stubbornly widespread that members of the upper crust, government ministers, the Roman Catholic Church, the court of King Albert II, belonged to child sex rings, or protected them. The lingering distrust of the people was not alleviated by the fact that a parliamentary inquiry had, in April of 1997, identified 30 officials who had, as the Times tactfully put it, failed to uncover the true's misdeeds. Nearly a year later, none of them had yet suffered any repercussions. Additionally, at least 10 missing children suspected of having fallen prey to Detroux's operation have never been found. The Commission's report was, in many people's eyes, a shameless cover-up. As the News Telegraph summarized, the report said competition between rival forces had prevented vital information from being exchanged and obvious evidence from being followed up, rather than acknowledge the obvious, which was that rampant police corruption and complicity were to blame. Just a few months before the Commission issued its report, The Telegraph was reporting that, grim rumors, had been circulating that a second pedophile network at least as appalling may have been operating in parallel to that said to involve Detroux. The bodies of seven children were believed to have been hidden by the ring, which was thought could be linked to Detroux through Michel Nyoul. Two months after that, a man named Patrick Darochet and three of his family members were arrested following the discovery of the body of a nine-year-old girl. Rumors quickly began circulating linking this crime to Detroux as well. Like Detroux, Darochet had previously been convicted on multiple counts of child rape. 
he had been committed to a psychiatric institution from which he was released after just six weeks. Authorities quickly denied that there was any connection between the two cases. In January of 1998, however, The Telegraph reported that, new evidence from a lawyer involved in the investigations blows a hole in previous police claims that there was no link between the cases involving the alleged child murderers Mark Dutroux and Patrick Deroshet. Once again, the connection was said to be through Nyul. In April of 1999, The Guardian reported that, the highly respected chairman of a parliamentary inquiry into the case claims that his commission's findings were muzzled by political and judicial leaders to prevent details emerging of complicity in the crimes, Mr. Verwill again claims that senior political and legal figures refused to cooperate with the inquiry. He says magistrates and police were officially told to refuse to answer certain questions, in what he describes as a characteristic smothering operation. As of August of 2001, fully five years after Dutroux was taken into custody, his trial had yet to begin. Parents of victims continued to shout of a cover-up, and The Telegraph was reporting that, it was recently learned that scientific tests on 6,000 hairs found in the, underground dungeon, began only this year. These tests could, of course, reveal how many victims passed through Dutroux's chamber of horrors. If the Mark Dutroux case were some kind of aberration, it would still be a disturbing story for the level of unspeakable corruption and depravity of the Belgian political and law enforcement establishment of which it speaks. Far more disturbing is the fact that it doesn't appear to be an isolated case at all. As 1999 drew to a close, the nation of Latvia was rocked by a child prostitution slash child pornography scandal that reached to the very top of the political power structure. The case first broke in August when police uncovered a massive operation involving as many as 2,000 severely abused children. When media reports began linking top Latvian officials to the case, a special parliamentary commission was formed to investigate. In February 2000, the chairman of the commission delivered a report to parliament linking the country's prime minister, justice minister, director of the state revenue service, and a number of army and law enforcement officers to the case. Efforts were immediately begun to discredit the commission chairman, including allegations that he is tied to the former KGB, a classic case of red baiting, enabling the allegations to be dismissed as communist propaganda. The BBC reported in June of 1999 that two unnamed German men had gone on trial, accused of running a child pornography ring in Germany, Poland and the Czech Republic. The pair, along with at least 11 identified but unindicted accomplices, made video recordings of the gang's abusing children between the ages of 3 and 14 since 1993. A large but unspecified quantity of videos, photography, magazines and CD-ROMs containing child pornography were confiscated. Also noted was a possible connection to the Detroux case, there have been cases of Slovak children being taken to Vienna to make pornographic films. The Belgian pedophile Mark Detroux, was a regular visitor to one Slovak town. The BBC also filed a brief report on a 1996 case that went almost completely unreported in the English language press. Mexican police broke up an international child pornography ring based in the resort of Acapulco which they said had at least 4,000 clients in the United States, emphasis added. A UN envoy investigating the case said that the child pornography sometimes involved babies of less than one month old. On September 29th of 2000, the Irish Times reported that, Eight people were arrested in Italy and three in Russia, and police said 1,700 people were being investigated in Italy, as yet another pedophile network surfaced. The images traded by this ring were divided into several categories, the most gruesome, police said, was coded Necros Pedo, in which children were raped and tortured to death. And so it is that we first confront the most disturbing of topics, snuff films, which we all know don't really exist. As recently as February of 1999. The New York Post assured readers that, snuff films are the stuff of urban legend, how did this legend get started? No one knows. The unfortunate truth though is that they do, as it turns out, actually exist, and they likely have existed for as long as film has existed, though they weren't always known by that name. According to the Post, the term snuff was actually coined during the Charles Manson case, when press reports repeated a rumor that the Manson family had filmed home movies of the brutal slangs. Other reports hold that the term was coined in 1976 by a writer for the New York Times who was in need of a phrase to describe reports of murders following sexual activity being captured on film. Not long after that, as Carl Rash wrote, the Texas House Select Committee on Child Pornography disclosed in the late 1970s that investigators probing leads to organized crime in Houston, Dallas, and other major cities found that slave auctions for 16- and 17-year-old boys were routinely held in Mexico. 
Some of the boys were featured in brutal snuff or slasher movies. Rashk also quotes from a study by U.S. mental health professionals that claimed that a child from Mexico can be packaged, delivered, and sold deep within this country in a short time, and that many are purchased solely for the purpose of killing. In Enslaved, Gordon Thomas reported that, at the start of the year, 1991, Britain's Scotland Yard was continuing to investigate reports that up to 20 children in London had been murdered last year in, snuff films, and the videotapes sold on the continent. An account of the Italian case carried by The Guardian affirmed the existence of snuff films. Police have discovered a massive international pedophile network selling violent child pornography videos to clients in Italy, the US and Germany. Authorities are, trying to identify 5,000 people who are suspected of attempting to purchase the videos, some of which appear to contain images of children being tortured and murdered. The UK's Independent, in a follow-up published in November of 2000, also confirmed that the seized materials did in fact include child snuff films, horrified investigators gathered images of more than 2,000 children who were filmed while being abused, raped, and, killed. By that time, close to 1,500 people had been charged in the case, but not, as The Guardian noted, those in high places who are believed to form a pedophile lobby. As in the Belgian and Latvian cases, there were clear indications of high-level complicity and a strong belief among the Italian people that the facts of the case were being covered up. And as with the other cases, the magistrate heading up the inquiry provoked a furor by denouncing a pedophile lobby supported by politicians which he said openly obstructed the investigators and worked to prevent tougher sanctions for the consumers of child pornography, according to The Independent. The New York Times reported in March of 1997 that there is growing public indignation in France and elsewhere about the recurrent reports of kidnapping, rape or incest involving the very young. The same Times report noted that, police across France have detained more than 250 people and confiscated some 5,000 videocassettes in conjunction with an investigation into a massive child pornography ring. Those detained by police were described as mainly married professionals. A dozen of them would soon turn up dead allegedly suicide victims. In June, the News Telegraph spoke of over 800 French homes being raided and 204 suspects being taken into custody the week before. Among those detained were, more than 30 teachers, and a number of priests, as well as the deputy mayor of the town of saint Miel. By the end of the week, four had committed suicide, including a school headmaster. Three years later, the BBC filed a very brief report noting that a verdict was due in the trial of more than 60 people accused of possessing child pornography. One of the judges hearing the case said examining the video evidence made him feel physically sick. In a familiar refrain, it was reported that, the French courts have been accused of attacking the easy targets, porn consumers, rather than producers and distributors. And one children's rights group has alleged that senior public figures were among those investigated, but their cases were dropped before coming to court. In 1998, another large-scale international ring was discovered operating out of the Netherlands and Berlin, Germany. The New York Times reported that investigators called the case nauseating, in that images of abuse of even babies and infants were peddled via the internet and other media. Police discovered voluminous records of what appear to be clients and suppliers from countries including Israel, Ukraine, Britain, Russia and the United States. The ring was first uncovered when a key member was found dead in Italy. According to the Irish Times, he was murdered by another member of the ring. His apartment in the Dutch town of Zandvoort was found to contain thousands of digital images stored on computer disks, as well as hundreds of addresses of suspected suppliers and clients, according to the New York Times. The images shocked even veteran sex crimes investigators, one of whom stated that the seized evidence left him speechless. It looks like the perpetrators are not dealing with human beings but with objects. In September 1998, Another ring was raided, what the BBC described as a larger and more sinister pedophile network called Wonderland. The network was so named in honor of Lewis Carroll's revered children's book, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Carroll was widely known to have a predilection for underage girls and boys, and is now something of a patron saint of pedophiles around the globe. A concerted effort has been made over the decades to cover up Carroll's pedophilic tendencies, though the truth is evident even in the heavily whitewashed profiles of him that can be found in modern encyclopedias. Microsoft Sankarta notes that, always a friend of children, particularly little girls, Carroll wrote thousands of letters to them, and also that he gained an additional measure of fame as an amateur photographer. Most of his camera portraits were of children in various costumes and poses, including nude studies. 
The Encyclopedia Britannica reports that Carroll's photographic hobby was abandoned in 1880, while dismissing suggestions that this sudden decision was reached because of an impurity of motive for his nude studies. Britannica also notes that Carroll, who was raised in an environment where there were few friends outside the family, and who was ordained a deacon in the Church of England on the winter solstice of 1861, an occult holiday, generally lost interest in his child friends when they reached the age of 12. Wonderland is also the name of the quarterly publication of the Lewis Carroll Collectors Guild, which bills itself as a voluntary association of persons who believe nudist materials are a constitutionally protected expression and whose collective interests include preteen nudes. As Gordon Thomas has noted, in Wonderland the delights of transgenerational sex pepper the pages. Such is the legacy of the men whose literary works are peddled to our children. But here I digress. The San Jose Mercury News reported that, police in, 22 states and 13 foreign countries conducted coordinated raids, aimed at breaking up an internet child pornography ring. The ring involves as many as 200 people around the world, who exchanged over the internet thousands of sexually explicit images of children as young as 18 months. The Independent later reported that the ring shared pictures of children being abused, in some cases live via webcam broadcasts over the internet. The raids included homes in Australia, Austria, Belgium, Finland, France, Germany, Italy, Norway, Portugal, and Sweden, according to the New York Times, which added that, several dozen people were arrested, but officials said they expected more than 100 to be charged. The Independent later reported that 107 suspects were ultimately arrested. The Mercury News implied that this may be only the tip of the iceberg, the ring actually extends into 47 countries. The case was described by a British official as stomach-churning. The Times reported that Wonderland club members are believed to have posed their own children for pictures, in other cases, parents may have taken money to let their children be used. The Guardian reported that over 1,250 children were featured in the photos and videos, many of whom suffered appalling injuries and were seen sobbing uncontrollably as they were being sexually violated. The Independent added that the victimized children were mostly under, the age of, 10. A BBC report held that the combined raids resulted in the seizure of more than 750,000 computer images of children. A detective superintendent with the British National Crime Squad called these images disgusting and the behavior that has been carried out is absolutely appalling. Though ignored by the American press, Wonderland originated in the United States. Among the scores of U.S. homes raided, one yielded a database of more than 100,000 sexual photographs of naked boys and girls. Interestingly enough, the Times also noted that another raid, in Missouri, turned up a cache of weapons as well as child pornography in a heavily fortified trailer, illustrating once again, as did the Detroit case, the close ties between organized pedophilia and other terrorist assaults against society. As with the earlier raids in Europe, a rash of suicides soon followed. By October 24, the Mercury News was reporting that no fewer than four of the 34 American suspects had killed themselves. These included a retired Air Force pilot, a microbiologist at the University of Connecticut, and a computer consultant in Colorado. In the UK, the Wonderland raids, dubbed Operation Cathedral, resulted in the indictments of eight suspects. One of the eight turned up dead four months later, another alleged suicide. The other seven were given ridiculously light sentences in February of 2001 for their complicity in inflicting unfathomable abuse on countless children. Sentences ranged from 12 to 30 months. Just a few weeks before the sentences were handed down, The Guardian was reporting that, police today arrested 13 suspected pedophiles in the largest ever UK operation against child pornography. Once again a massive amount of appalling evidence was seized, with most of the material featuring scenes of children being raped and sexually abused. The Independent reported in February of 2001 that, detectives working on the, Wonderland, case discovered that many of the pedophiles were also members of other child pornography groups. One of the groups most closely tied to Wonderland was a ring known as the Orchid Club, which had been exposed by a 1996 investigation in San Jose, California. That investigation had led to the indictment of 16 men on charges of conspiring to produce and exchange child pornography. Members of the club were identified in at least nine states and three foreign countries. By the time of the Wonderland raids, the Mercury News was able to report that the purported ringleader of the Orchid Club and 12 others either have pleaded guilty or have been convicted in connection with that case. Their crimes included recruiting young relatives and friends of their own children to be molested and photographed. The club was also, like Wonderland, involved in real-time exploitation of children on the Internet. 
club members were able to send in requests and have them acted out on live feeds. The club also held a pedophile summit, at which members traded stories about preteen girls they had molested and photographed in sexually explicit poses. The summit was held, appropriately enough, on April 20th, the birth date of Adolf Hitler and a major satanic holiday. In late March of 2001, yet another interlinked global network was exposed. The Independent reported that, U.S. authorities announced the arrest of four American citizens for involvement in an international child ring called Blue Orchid. The Los Angeles Times added further details the next day, reporting that the United States and Russia have shut down a Moscow-based international pornography ring that used the Internet to sell videotapes of children engaged in sexual acts. These tapes were said to sell for between $200 and $300. An Associated Press release held that, police seized some 600 videotapes, 200 digital video discs and many boxes of photographs. Video duplication equipment and sales and shipping records were also seized leading to criminal inquiries in 24 nations, many of the tapes were bought by people in the United States, others went to Germany, Britain, France, Denmark, China, Kuwait, Mexico and scores of other countries. The Times reported that nine people had been arrested and 15 search warrants issued. The AP report noted that four of those arrested were in Russia, where two suspects had, alas, committed suicide. The ring was also said by the Times to offer what were cryptically referred to as custom-made videos for the hefty price of $5,000 each. The contents of these videos were not revealed. What was revealed though was that the prevalence of child pornography has increased dramatically with the growth of the Internet. There are approximately 100,000 websites worldwide associated with child pornography. This point was reinforced the very next day when the UK press reported police raids on yet another pedophile ring. The Guardian reported that. More than 30 people, including a man working for a national youth organization, were arrested yesterday in dawn raids on the homes of suspected pedophiles. Once again being sold and traded were images which showed children being abused. A report on the case in the Independent quoted a law enforcement spokesman as revealing that those arrested included members of some interesting professions, though demurring from revealing what those professions might be. The official also said that they had a disturbing scenario of one or two juveniles who have been caught in this way. One of them appears to be a 13-year-old boy. The police did acknowledge that the arrested boy was also a potential victim and would be treated in that light, which seems rather obvious. Nevertheless, a follow-up to the story that the Independent ran in May reported that the boy had become one of the youngest people to be listed on the sex offenders register. The very next month, The Guardian carried a report on Eric Franklin Rosser, accused child pornographer. One of the FBI's 10 most wanted criminals and a former keyboardist for John Cougar Mellon Camp's band. According to the report, investigators believe Rosser's material is among pornography circulated by a British pedophile ring. More than 1,800 members are thought to belong to a club called Teen Boys. Its website features boys aged around 12. Teen Boys is considered bigger than the notorious Wonderland Club. Meanwhile, a pedophile ring in Australia with high-level government connections was handled in a slightly different way. As the Irish Times reported on July 17, 1998. Police suspect a series of gruesome gay hate killings in the Sydney region could be the work of a serial killer whose victims might be linked through a notorious pedophile ring. The latest mutilation murder was that of Australia's longest-serving mayor, Frank Harkel, aged 68, who was bludgeoned to death in his flat and who had previously faced 29 child sex charges. In the past few months two other men, one a convicted child sex offender, were attacked in their homes in similar circumstances and also suffered horrific injuries. Arkell, the former Lord Mayor of Wollongong, 50 miles south of Sydney, was a key witness in a royal commission into police corruption which uncovered a network of pedophiles. Those serial killers sure come in handy sometimes. As the Mercury News reported, by the end of the year, 50 children had been interviewed by investigators. Children at West Point told stories that would become horrifyingly familiar. They said they had been ritually abused. They said they had had excrement smeared on their bodies and been forced to eat feces and drink urine. They said they were taken away from the daycare center and photographed. Despite abundant medical and psychological evidence, and literally dozens of child witnesses, and despite 950 interviews by 60 FBI agents assigned to the investigation, an investigation led by former U.S. Attorney Rudolph Giuliani produced no federal grand jury indictments, according to the Herald Record. The Herald also noted that, in 1987, Giuliani said his detailed investigation showed only one or two children were abused. This was, it should be noted, 
a barefaced lie from the fascistic future mayor and would-be senator, as the Herald report divulged, a still-secret, independent report, produced by one of the nation's top experts on child sexual abuse, confirms the children's accusations of abuse. This was not the first time that the prestigious Academy had shown an appalling willingness to overlook extreme levels of abuse directed at children by Army personnel. A year before the abuse case broke, a 22-month-old child was murdered by an Army staff sergeant. The Mercury News reported that, after a court-martial hearing, the sergeant was given an 18-month suspended sentence and dishonorable discharge. In other words, he served no time and was essentially given a free ride for murdering a child. With help from Giuliani, the FBI, the U.S. Army, and the grand jury, the abusers of countless children at the daycare center, which was, appropriately enough, building number 666 on the academy grounds, were likewise given a free ride. The initial arrest of the finders in Tallahassee, Florida went almost completely unnoticed by the media. So too did another arrest in that same state in August of 2000, just before Florida gained newfound fame as the land of the hanging chads. The arrested man was Wayne Kamali, and the charge was operating an online child pornography site. The Los Angeles Times reported that the West Palm Beach home in which Kamali was arrested, not unlike the finder's van, was filled with so much rotting garbage, trash and cat feces that the agents had to borrow oxygen masks and hazardous materials suits from the county fire department to carry out the search. Seized in the raid were numerous videotapes and a computer. The most significant aspect of the arrest is that it was initiated by police investigating Belgium's most notorious pedophile murder case. It seems that Kamali had close connections to Felix de Konung, a suspect in the kidnapping and molestation of a 14-year-old girl, and, de Konung in turn had links to Marc de True. And so we end up right back where we began, with the case of the Belgian beast. The Brief Times report closed by stating that, US officials couldn't elaborate on the connection between de Konung and de True but said they were part of the same child pornography, molestation and murder investigation. It is unlikely that the press will ever revisit the case of Wayne Kamali, tellingly, the LA Times article has disappeared from the newspaper's online archives. As with so many other cases, the final words of the Customs Memorandum on the Finder's investigation will likely provide the epitaph for this case as well, no further information will be available. No further action will be taken. The Pedophocracy is term coined by David McGowan. It is the title of his book on the subject of pedophilia as an elite habit and one of the main tools of control of the visible ruling elites, by those not so visible. Of all human vices and perversions, pedophilia is one of the most shameful and outrageous in the public mind, giving it great potential as a source of control. This is a deeply disturbing subject. In similar fashion to the proposition that deep state actors commit false flag terror attacks against their own populations to further their agendas, people are reluctant to consider the thought that child sexual abuse could be systematically cultivated and used as a calculated and deliberate means of Machiavellian control. Many people simply do not want to be told such things. Outrage is thus indulged for a while before relapse into the consensus trance of everyday routine, where fear of strangers in the dark are relegated to the subconscious and the odd bad dream. To be enlisted to the pedophocracy novitiate so to speak is a temptation difficult for the psychopathic personality type that aspires to power to decline. To become a first degree member is to sell one's soul, and there are probably 30 odd higher degrees each capable of making an offer that cannot be refused by their juniors. Standard military discipline simply cannot hold a candle to it, special forces SIS type skills and disciplines clearly make extensive use of the victims of it. The main witness in the De True Affair explains the inner workings of this network. Contracts between the business milieu and the political world, contracts between businessmen amongst each other, fraud with subsidies or licenses, setting up fake firms, criminal contracts like arms trade. Everything was possible. And it always ended with sex and children. Pictures were taken, in jest, to keep both parties to their contracts. Step-by-step -step customers, who first went to bed with me cautiously, were stimulated to rougher sex. I was forced to help them with that. They became complicit and at the same time their mutual connections became tighter. Not one of these people was still inclined to sign contracts with individuals outside the network. If that happened one could make them pay dearly for that. Regina Loof, 1998. There is a large body of information available on the internet for those with a stomach for it. The deeper the investigation, the greater the unpleasant realization that the phenomenon is fundamentally ingrained in Western establishment power structures. 
An earlier high-profile case in Omaha, Nebraska, USA, the Franklin case, received similar treatment by the commercially controlled media, as it seems do all cases where investigations begin to threaten powerful interests. In 1993 Yorkshire Television sent Tim Tate to Omaha with a team to make a documentary, to investigate, document, and interview those close to the Franklin case. Throughout the following months the crew collected hours of interviews, spending nearly half a million dollars in the process. The title of the documentary spoke its fate. Conspiracy of Silence was scheduled to air on May 3, 1994, but the documentary was pulled by the Discovery Channel, and it has never aired on TV. The TV schedule was subsequently falsified to present the appearance that it was never scheduled citation needed. John DeCamp, author of the Franklin cover-up, said that informants had told him that the documentary had been pulled after Congress struck a deal with cable companies. While other Washington officials said the documentary contained pornographic material and should not be aired. John DeCamp was anonymously mailed a cutting room copy of the documentary in 1995. Real questions to all Annans. How do these people find each other? How do they know that they can rely on one another? It's absolutely mind-boggling to me. I've heard from some conspiracy radio hosts that it's because they're usually into Satanism and it's their Satanism that draws them together and this stuff is just the initiation process slash regular activities to make sure they're in the cult. But is that explanation viable? The Finders cult seems to be evidence for that. But then you have the story in the op and this Australia story which just sounds like rich and powerful politicians who have evil desires plain and simple without being in a cult. How do these people find each other? They grow up together, this tradition dates back to before the time of the Caesars and is present in every nation and culture on earth. Satanism is just hooga booga for the plebs, these people were tortured as children so they also torture creating new members of the lifestyle, the same families practice this way and they have a tendency towards similar attitudes and institutions. Chelsea Clinton sitting on the board of Interactive Corp with Barry Diller who is married to Princess Diane von Forstenberg and her son Prince Alexander von Forstenberg is also on that board, are these families similar in accusation and reputation? Probably, where did they all go to school? Tony Rezko is a financier from Chicago that was convicted of wire fraud, money laundering, and corrupt solicitation which was a watered-down charge for extortion. Rikso also helped to finance Barack Obama's Senate campaign and sold him part of his property above the market value while under federal investigation. The Clinton and Obama families are in league with the Chicago outfit and that is why Barack Obama was a professor at the University of Chicago. Rahm Emanuel is a Jewish mobster and associate of the Chicago mob for the mob is the mayor of Chicago and former chief of staff under Barack Obama. The Jesuit Georgetown educated John Podesta is from Chicago and the name Podesta is an Italian word for a high official or the chief magistrate of a city. Checked. It's also to note that the control is so great they actually have public trafficking hubs. Pick related. Article in the Bild newspaper, one of if not the biggest in Germany from June 22. 474 Vietnamese children disappearing from Berlin linked to the Dong Sun Asia shopping mall. This mall is goal of a high amount of trafficking routes as stated before court. States how they traffic people, often from poor families or orphans from Asia directly to the Dong Sun Center for 15,000 euros. Those then are forced to work in Germany to pay the loan back, unless the transport was paid for, probably often by pedos and human traffickers. Trafficked children work in whorehouses and massage studios. If police catches the minors they get put into institutions. From these they often disappear again, claim to run away but who believes that? This center is still not closed down. This mall had a couple of his storehouses burned down for over 24, 24, hours just the other day until they could finally finish putting it out. This totally wasn't just getting rid of evidence. Belgian Ultra Red Pilled Member of Parliament Laurent Louis exposed former Belgian prime and raging homosexual Elio Di Rupo as a child molester and possible member of the Detroux Network. He was kicked out of Parliament. Watch his speech it's red pilled as fuck. Thanks. First link is even blocked in Belgium due to a privacy complaint. 1104 and first bit. You know all those quotes about how NPC will get angry at you for bringing up truth? This woman walks out because he brings up the horrible way this girl died and then the rest walk out. These dogs should be shot desu. 
Pourquoi n'a-t-on pas été plus loin Avait-on peur de retrouver la trace de personnalités influentes I also think it's very interesting that Brussels shows up in the FBI's documents on the finders. Finders equals pedo cult. Last page is pick related. Brussels equals de true affair. This is good for the fact it goes into far more detail than anywhere else I've found, particularly regarding the police officers and their supposed ignorance. This case is often overlooked when discussing these things. Quick rundown. Three Spanish teenage girls are kidnapped in 1992. Tortured, raped and shot. Out of two men who kidnapped them, only one was caught. There was DNA of seven people in the girls not belonging to each other or their kidnappers, investigation on them goes nowhere. The one man arrested and convicted for the case was released in 2013 because indefinite sentence was considered cruel and unusual punishment by EU's Court of Justice. The second kidnapper was never caught. This case is often overlooked when discussing these things. Don't forget McMartin and West Point also Presidio. We had the Casapia Pedo scandal here in Portugal but all the material I have is in Portuguese. Dave McGowan mentioned it in his book though. It's an almost exact copy of the true when it comes to the type of people involved and how the damage control was done. I am 100% certain that our current half budget Prime Minister is blackmailed pedo. That case actually links to the drugs directly. Wanna get weird? Was reading the true papers a while back and some details sounded familiar. Estate with doors that lead nowhere. Like H.H. H. Holmes, the serial killer. He went to University of Michigan Medical School alongside William James Mayo. One of the seven founders of the Mayo Clinic. And John Jacob Abel. Abel showed great interest in isolating pure form of internal gland hormones. The first work that led to his international reputation as a pharmacologist and biochemist was the isolation of epinephrine from adrenal medulla. In other words, adrenochrome. Makes me wonder if these people have a playbook for torture because there are a lot of situational similarities between cases like this. Just to add, University of Michigan is in Ann Arbor. North Fox Island pedo ring. Oakland County child killer. Must just be a coincidence.